The Fed's two-day meeting starts right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures positive, nine-tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, the U.S. studying ways to guarantee all bank deposits. J.P. Morgan putting together a plan to support First Republic as the Federal Reserve's two-day meeting begins in D.C. We begin with the big issue. It's over to you, Chair Powell. I'm anxious to see what the Fed does. We're facing a big Fed meeting this week. Aiming both for price stability and for financial stability. Whether the Fed tightens or not. That's what he's got to get across, and it's, going, it's not going to be easy. You don't want to play around with banking crises. It certainly has given the Fed reason to pause. Taking a breather on the rate hike process is is prudent. Do they pause? Another question altogether. The market is giving them 25 basis points. Go to 25, wait and watch what happens. They can't quite stare the inflation bear in the eyes and do nothing. There is an opportunity there, we think, for the Fed to step in and really add a bit of confidence to this situation. We say it every time that it's the most important Fed meeting. I think this one actually is. Your team coverage begins right now with Bloomberg's Caddy Lines alongside AMH down in DC. Anne-Marie, first to you. Before we hear from Chairman Powell, we'll hear from the Treasury Secretary. Yeah, that's right, Jonathan. We already got an excerpt of what she plans to say at this banking conference. One, she's going to defend the government actions. And then in the second point, she's going to potentially try to stem off any of that exodus we're seeing from some of these smaller, mid-sized banks into bigger banks when it comes to deposit. Here is the excerpt that she said. Our intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system, and similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffer dis uh, deposit runs that pose the risk of contagion. It's that smaller acts similar actions Jonathan these dra uh, dr kind of drastic actions the US government took that she's saying they could step in again potentially a little bit of verbal intervention I think what's so interesting about what the Treasury Department decided to release this excerpt before we have the market open she's not expected to speak until an hour's time the Kelly Lyons First Republic we're looking for a plan what is the plan well, that's an excellent question, John. There's perhaps the plan in the private sector and J.P. Morgan converting those $30 billion in deposits into a capital infusion. But there also is contingency planning happening within the U.S. authorities here in Washington and the Treasury Department studying how they may be able to expand FDIC deposit insurance to cover all deposits, not just those that make uh, are under that $250,000 limit. That would be in line with what mid-sized banks have asked for. A coalition of them wrote to the FDIC asking them to insure all deposits uh, for two years uh, earlier. But, of course over the weekend, but this is going to be a very difficult political question. For First Republic, though, you do see the stock up 26 percent. It may be because of that consideration on deposits covered that could help uh, stop the flight of deposits we have seen from that bank uh, to larger banks potentially, or because it's J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon trying to attempt another rescue of that bank, John. Kaylee, if you've got a sense as to why this bank is so important to these big banks on Wall Street, well, I think it was forced importance because we did have Treasury Secretary Yellen personally meeting with Jamie Dimon here in Washington about this issue last week. But I think it is about stemming the broader confidence crisis that we have seen in the banking system. No bank probably wants to see this kind of deposit flight and turmoil within the banking sector. And given that the government had already stepped in to make depositors whole in Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, there was a lot of concern about that being framed as a bailout. It raises the question of the ability uh, to repeat that so maybe banks themselves are trying to stem the bleeding here as well but it, it is it is a very valid question John considering this is not a bank that at least before two weeks ago was considered too big to fail I guess there's a question now of if any bank is going to be allowed to fail going forward MH that question to you as well I think we need to talk about this all of a sudden First Republic becomes this big deal for big banks on Wall Street Anne-Marie why 
Well, I think one of the reasons is that they don't want this, as Kaylee said, to stem to any other banks. If it's first, first republic, and then that one fails, what other banks potentially could then fail? And if you have to stop the bleeding somewhere. So they obviously saw something with this bank that they all felt the need. Eleven banks, remember, felt the need to step in and shore it up to make sure that this would not spread from what that bank to the other. Uh, clearly, this is a bigger concern, not just for banks, Bank CEOs. Yes, Jamie Dimon was here speaking with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last week. But writ large, the U.S. government obviously is concerned. They don't want to see any other banks in the situation First Republic's in. Hey, mate, you've got to tell the guy next to you just to stop while you're talking. <laughs> Well, you've got to shout. <laughs> AMH, Dan in Washington, thank you. Alongside Kelly Lyons as well. First Republic today, we've got a bounce. We're up by 26, 27 percent. Let's get to Exonics Peter Cicchini, Matt Miskin of JH Investments. Matt, what do you think of this? This line from Secretary Yellen this morning. Good morning to you both. Our intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system, and similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffer deposit runs that pose the risk of contagion. Is that sufficient for you, Matt? Are those words enough? I would just be careful writing a check you can't cash. In that, the, what she's implying, that's a lot of money. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars, potentially, of backing all the banks. And that's a totally different playing field, too. That's a, that's a change to the banking system overall, because if you do say that the FDIC has all deposits, they're going to have to pay more. And that's going to lower margins. And right now, what you're seeing is you've got this shock and awe and volatility in the banking system right now in terms of the stocks that are playing this, is it a bankruptcy, is it not a solvency risk trade? But then you've got a longer term issue of, are the profit margins going to be there, net interest margins going to be there, lower interest rate environment? And that likely to us is going to weigh on the banks. Uh, we see financials right now still pretty expensive at 1.3 times book. You know, we'd be interested maybe around book value, but for now we're we're still a bit cautious, even though they are running this morning. Pete, are you on the same page? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Matt on that. You know, but job one right now is restoration of confidence. So I'm not sure they're actually worried about uh, you know whether or not they're able to cash that check, as he said, because um, they believe they can. Um, you know, part of the problem here, though. Um, is the moral hazard this creates. And it has not been discussed very much at all. And I think the reason for that is because we, we know a few things. Um, fractional reserve banking systems are fragile by their very nature. And so we're all asking, why is uh, First Republic so important? Well, it is a fractional reserve banking system. And even a small butterfly fly flapping its wings in a distant place can affect the entire system because of the leverage embedded and inherent in the system. Um, importantly as well is the fact that the bank lending channel is absolutely paramount to growth. And when that is impaired, which, which it will be now, right, because net interest margins are going to compress as banks have to uh, pay more to attract depositors uh, in an already inverted yield curve environment, um, alongside the fact that lending standards will invariably go up in an environment where lending standards were already tightening, um, I think that's why uh, the Treasury and the Fed have invoked Section 13.3 again with their lending facility, and they're doing everything they can to restore confidence. Because once confidence is gone, it's much harder to get back. Pete, let's unpack some of that. Your first point. We're like this far away from totally transforming the banking system in this country. And Pete, to your point, we need to give it a whole lot more thought. How do you think that could change, that move alone, just to ensure all deposits, even if it's just for a couple of years, to go in that direction again? Where would that leave banking and where would it leave investment opportunities for you? Well, let's just think about it from a social perspective to start. It comes very close to the socialization of the banking system and the socialization of risk at private banks. Um, and I think that's incredibly dangerous because once that happens and private actors within markets can no longer no longer bear the risk of their behavior, that is to say they can lend and know that for whatever reason, if things go south, that you know, their pot depositors will stay with them. Um, that's extremely problematic, I think, for capital markets in general and for a capitalist society. Um, and whether or not Treasury and the Fed think they can team up uh, to do such a thing, that is to ensure all deposits, um, I think Congress uh, ought to take a pretty close look at that before that actually happens. Marco Kalanovich says already that we're at the point 
of no return. The Fed has gone past that point. This is what he had to say in his note this week. He said the Fed is facing a difficult task. It is likely already past the point of no return. A soft landing now looks unlikely with the airplane at a tailspin, a lack of market confidence, engines about to turn off, bank lending. Matt, do you see it that way? Have we gone past the point of no return considering two weeks ago we were talking about 50 basis point hikes and a boom economy? Yeah, John, when the two-year Treasury yield starts acting like a main stock, we've got some problems. And really, you know, I know you tweeted about this this morning, but, you know, it's been two-year yield went much higher after the last Fed meeting and then plummeted. When the two-year yield usually plummets below the Fed funds rate, if you look back over the last 50 years, that's a sign the Fed is going to be pausing and then cutting in the not-so-distant future. And even though the two-year yield has been making up some of the ground it lost, last week it was down 77 basis points in a week. That is the biggest weekly decline in over 30 years. Yeah. And that just to me, that's a signal that that's really where the direction of the Fed is going to be going. I know it's incredibly volatile, but when the two year yield is well below the Fed funds rate, and to me, I, I think they go 25 basis points. I think they put it at five. They say, look, you know, look back on history. We went to 5% with high inflation. Um, but then, you know, the bond market is pricing in already a cut. At basically the next, well, sorry, they have a, a May rate hike priced in as well, but then a cut in June, and then two more cuts after that. So the bond market's saying, yeah, you're going to raise rates, but it's going to be a mistake, and you're going to be cutting in not so distant future. Look at this trip. Let's stay on that chart. February 1st, that was when the Federal Reserve met. That was a Wednesday, and the two year yield then at the close was 4.1%. We went as high as 5.08%, something like that. And look at this, back to where we started again at 4.1%. We've hardly moved, nothing's happened if you've been on a rock for like two months. Pete, the Federal Reserve, you heard Matt then, they're going 25, but ultimately this market's screaming they're done and a lot of people think they're done. Do you agree? Do you think they're done? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to agree with Matt. Um, uh, again, you know, one of the things that we like to look at here um, is the, the, the swaps and volatility surface and specifically what does two-year versus 10-year swaps and volatility look like. And when that inverts, um, that screams uh, that the Fed is at some point going to be in need of a cut. It also uh, screams that equity market volatility is wildly dislocated. Um, I think it's also important to, to recognize the Fed uh, has recently reiterated the fact that it has different tools for different kinds of problems. Probably one of the reasons it's been so aggressive in using the financial stability tools specifically. So I do agree we get 25 basis points, but it will be bathed in more dovish language than it has heretofore. Um, but the Fed remains data dependent, so uh, we get we get the hike. It'll be it'll be dovish, um, but I, I still believe that even if the Fed starts to cut, if his, history is any guide, um, going into a, 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 a recession, which I believe is unavoidable at this point equity markets will will have to correct much further and that often happens as the Fed is cutting. We'll come back to those comments in just a moment. Peter Cicchini, Matt Miskin sticking with us. Equity futures right now near session highs of nine tenths of one percent with some movers going into the up and bow. Here's Abby. And a big piece of the rally, John, of course, is the bounce in banks that we're seeing you and Kelly talking about in particular for the regionals and First Republic. Those shares up the last time I looked right now at session highs up 28 percent as investors are today focusing on the 30 billion dollar lifeline plus that possibility that you all were talking about unlimited deposit guarantee. I would caution, though, this stock was up 26 percent on the close last Tuesday and then fell precipitously, so volatility is the name of the game. Bank of America and other big banks up sharply, and this, of course, as yields are backing up in a big way. That, of course, helps the lending business. Tesla up 2.6 percent. They're now a blue-chip rated company, no longer junk. Moody's has joined S&P in making them IG. And uh, BI is saying that this is a real game-changer, historic event. And then, finally, Carnival up 3.25 percent. Deutsche Bank is saying, you want to buy this stock ahead of earnings on the 27th. So we have a, a broad-based rally this morning, John. Abby, thanks for that. Coming up on this program, waiting for the Fed's next move. I think we know they're not going to raise 50. We think, I think we know they're not going to cut rates. The real question is zero or 25. That's the question we'll try to answer. Up next. I think we know they're not going to raise 50. We think, I think we know they're not going to cut rates. The real question is zero or 25. 
the case for zero is do no harm. Uh, we know that the banking system's under stress. The case for 25 basis points is to say, look, we still have an inflation problem. Uh, we can do both. We can use our liquidity facilities to shore up the confidence in the banking system, and we use monetary policy to uh, bring down inflation. Last time we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell, he opened the door to 50 basis points. That was two weeks ago. Wall Street now taking sides on whether they make a move at all on Wednesday. Goldman, Wells, Barclays, they say the Fed is hitting pause. On the other side, looking for the Fed to stay the course with a 25 basis point increase. Morgan Stanley, City, Bank of America. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, that was the screen door, not the main door. And Jay Powell is not going to be opening the main door to 50 basis points this time. It has been a crazy couple of weeks. Remember when uh, Jay Powell went up to Capitol Hill and said, well, well, if the economy calls for it, we'll raise 50 basis points. Uh, you can see what that did to expectations for this meeting. Uh, and then they plunged on the uh, Silicon Valley Bank news and have sort of bounced around with the stock prices of regional banks. Right now, the green arrow is kind of pointing to where they would be if they went 25 basis points. The white line is where the market is. So the market's sort of coming to that level. They haven't gotten complete conviction yet that the Fed's going to do that, but there is a belief that maybe inflation is the issue. I think that Bill Dudley put it very, very well. Can't improve on that. Powell's problem is you got PCE inflation still at 5.4 percent. That's way above their 2 percent target, and GDP is not really slowing. Atlanta Fed GDP now, uh, latest number, 3.2 percent for the first quarter. So his choice is pause tightening tomorrow, promise more later. That would be a hawkish hold, or raise 25 tomorrow and promise to be vigilant. Uh, that would be something of a dovish raise. Uh, the questions that he's going to face are going to be very interesting. What's the economic outlook? We'll get the dot plot tomorrow. We'll get their summary of economic projections. What do they think is going to happen to inflation, unemployment, and to growth? The state of the nation's banks, there will be a lot of questions about that. And of course, he will be asked, how did you guys miss Silicon Valley Bank? John? It's going to face that question a few times, I imagine, Mike. Mike McKee is going to be there. Looking forward to Mike's coverage throughout the whole of tomorrow. This question has been asked a million times in the last week. Is there a policy conflict right now between targeting inflation and targeting doing something about financial instability? This was Seth Carpenter and Morgan Stanley. This is what he had to say. The current market volatility has the potential to tighten financial conditions and hurt economic growth. So if a central bank refrains from hiking, it is not a focus on financial stability at the expense of macroeconomic objectives. Matt Lazzelli of Deutsche Bank went one further too. We ultimately believe that the recent shock is likely to tighten financial conditions in a way that has brought sufficiently restrictive into closer view. Matt, do you agree with that take, that these two things aren't necessarily in conflict? Yeah, I mean, financial conditions are a tough one. And I, there was a great article I wrote this morning that's financial conditions are, you know, very subjective, very hard to pin down. I mean, high yield spreads are 500 basis points. That's not that wide. That's right in line with its 20 year average. Um, the dollar's been weakening. You know, if the dollar was strengthening, that would be more of a risk off environment. Um, but what you're seeing here is that I think the markets have actually handled this relatively well. Uh, and, and actually, equities are coming back a little bit. So I, we try not to use financial conditions because they're so quick to move. And, and they really, I think if the Fed over relies on financial conditions, it's just going to get whipsawed. And it's already, they're already getting whipsawed. I'm, I'm picturing John sitting around the table at the FOMC doing the summary of economic projections and everybody just going down and writing <laughs> numbers with, with just because it's, it's so hard. And you've got to, you know, you've got to understand that. You've got to respect that. It's a challenging job right now. But I think for them, you know, staying on the course with inflation, making sure that they're being, a, I'd say, a hawkish one rate hike and hold yeah. would be the best outcome uh, given everything that's going on. Matt, I'm totally with you. They might as well get the darts out, hand them round, and just start throwing them. The problem with this, Pete, is they have to do something. Don't necessarily have to do something. Of course, they could just trash it and not put out anything at all. But, Pete, if they do, it's not about where they truly believe things are going to go. Pete, it's about what they want to signal tomorrow and how they use the dots to do that. How do you expect them to do that? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that and, and uh, appreciated Matt's comments. The way they do it is going to be incredibly important. And if we take a half a step back and we say, why are we having this banking uh, malaise at the moment? Well, one of the reasons is inflation. I mean, it's much more complex than that, but it is the inflation on the heels of 
many years of very low rates. So we had banks risking on, so their asset quality deteriorated. Uh, you had tremendous volatility in deposits. That was the outgrowth of fiscal policy measures during the pandemic. We went from a glut in deposits uh, to now a dearth of deposits somehow within dates. Um, very, very odd. Um, but, but the idea here is, is that inflation is also at the core of this because the assets on bank balance sheets, which had been held to maturity, once they went held for sale and actually needed to be sold, were worth much less. So if we let, uh, if the Fed lets inflation continue to uh, progress uh, or remain where it is and rates have to go up even more later, that could exacerbate the banking problem. And so at the end of the day, I think the Fed has to bifurcate the problems, even though they're, they're in inextricably intertwined. The Fed has to continue to deal with inflation. I think they go 25. Uh, I think they say we stay data dependent, but certainly it's going to feel a lot less hawkish than it did last time. But equities, if you think about the way equities are interpreting this versus Fed fund futures, um, are expecting something in incredibly dovish, in, in my view, not, not an 80 percent chance of 25, which is what Fed funds are giving us. So I, I think 25, even with dovish, dovish positioning, could be um, uh, negative for uh, equity markets. Matt, I'm not sure if hikes are bullish, bearish. I've got no idea anymore, given the signal that you could get in the news conference. Matt, what are you looking for? And ultimately, where do you want to be positioned going into this one? Yeah, John, I think you got a good point because the ECB last week went with 50 basis points and that actually added confidence because they said if the ECB hadn't raised rates at all, there would have been signal of worse uh, outcomes for the banking system. So I do think they have to be confident. I think they have to go with 25 to, to ensure that they're saying, yeah, the economy is still strong enough for us to do this. Um, yeah, so in, in for positioning wise, you know, we're, we're looking at the quality factor. We really think balance sheet strength is gonna be the number one uh, work to do in terms of equity analysis here. On the bond side, I get the volatility. It's been very choppy. On the 10 year, 340 has been basically impossible to get through, but we're sticking with our high quality intermediate bond call to ride out this volatility. Hey Matt, there's tons of that, that's for sure. Tons of volatility. Matt Miskin, Peter Cicchini, thank you. Coming up the morning calls and later, the case for 25. Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth. with a lift here. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Morgan Stanley upgrading Harley-Davidson to overweight, highlighting effective restructuring strategy and attractive valuation. Steve Ford resuming coverage of Alphabet, 130 price target with a buy. The analyst saying the AI competition concerns are overdone. And finally, Morgan Stanley, its price target for Meta goes to 250, calling it the most durable mega cap with better cost-cutting measures than its peers. That stock is up by 2.9%. Up next on this program, Cameron Dawson and New Edge Wealth betting on the Fed to raise 25 basis points tomorrow. About 25 seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Equity futures with a lift up nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. The bank's doing better in the pre-market. First Republic with a real bounce a little bit earlier this morning. On the Nasdaq 100, up seven tenths of one percent on the session on the year. Absolutely flying. Let's open and bow, switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields look a little something like this on a 10 year higher by eight basis points, 356.57 on a two year yield. Even higher than that this morning on the two year Treasury in America, we're higher by 16 basis points to 4.14%. Mentioned this earlier, if you're just tuning in, welcome. When the Fed last met on Wednesday, February 1, we closed that day at 4.1%. This two years has been all over the place. It's back to about 4.1% after being north of 5, then south of 4, and now back to 4.14. In the FX market, euro dollar positive 6 tenths of 1%. Stronger euro for four straight sessions now, 107.86 and crude. Still below 70, 68.75, but positive on the day by 1.6%. 40 seconds in, we're positive 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up 9 tenths of 1%. The one stock to watch at the moment, First Republic. Shares trying to stage a comeback after record losses. The stock top in the S&P 500's worst performers at the close yesterday. Now it's taking JP Morgan's latest support efforts in stride. Kelly Lyons has more. Hey, Kelly. 
Yeah, massive 30% move to the upside at the opening bell today, John, which would make this the eighth in nine trading days that this stock has moved 15% or more in either direction. The one day it didn't, it was a 10% move. So that just goes to show you the kind of volatility that is surrounding this name at the moment. But as you say, the move this morning is to the upside. And maybe we can blame a lot of that on J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, who is reportedly, according to Bloomberg sources, orchestrating a plan to convert some of that $30 billion in deposits J.P. Morgan and 10 other large banks gave to First Republic last week into a capital infusion. The question is, does this do enough to support the bank? Because remember, we had uh, S&P Global Ratings downgrading the credit rating of First Republic twice in the span of less than a week because they said that $30 billion in deposits is not a long-term solution. I also would note that this stock dropped 47% in yesterday's session, even after we already had the reporting around this potential plan uh, from Jamie Dimon and co. So it raises the question of how much the move today is really about that versus maybe reporting uh, from Bloomberg that the FDIC is looking to extend uh, deposit insurance to cover all deposit uh, all deposits in the banking system in theory. All this said, looking at this move today, John, which, yes, is massive, it only goes so far to unwind the damage that has been done to this stock over the last 12 trading days or so. This is still a stock that has lost more than three-quarters of its value over that time, John. Brutal. Triple-digit stock only two weeks ago. Kelly, thank you for that. The bank's doing okay today, better than okay. The financials on the S&P 500, the best performing sector, the financials up by 1.9%, the S&P 500 advancing one full percentage point. The broader sector doing okay. Regional banks looking to post a second day of gains after the index hit its lowest level in two years. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Yeah, it's a real relief rally here today for the banks and the regional banks in particular. As you were just mentioning, the KRE, that regional banking spider, it's up 4 0.9%. And over the last nine sessions, six of those sessions, we've seen moves of greater than 3% up or down. This is the best day uh, going back to January of 2021, so almost uh, in more than two years. So that's the degree of the rallying at this point. And New York Bank, uh, Community Bank Corp up in a big way, PacWest as well. Beyond the relief, beyond the possibility of an unlimited backstop, take a look at this two year yield that you've been talking about. I mean, this is just incredible, up 32 basis points over the last two days, normalizing to some degree back above 4%. And it's not helping just the regional banks, but the big banks too. If you were to chart the uh, two-year yield over the last two days in the XLF, a broader look at the banks, you would see them basically moving in tandem. Because today on the session, we also have JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, all of these banks trading higher. I think that the yield's climbing. That's a big piece of the story this morning, John. Happy, thanks for that. Let's throw another name in there, New York Community Bank Corp. Let's take a look at that right now. D.A. Davidson upgrading the stock to a buy. It's positive 6%. The analyst Peter Winter citing the deal to acquire Signature Bank's deposits as attractively valued and, quote, a transformation to a more commercial bank-like structure. That stock is up by 5.6%. These names have been all over this place, including UBS, which has equally been all over the place over the last week. UBS right now up by 7% in Swiss trading to 18 60. Bloomberg's Jan Patrick Barnett joins us now from Frankfurt. Jan Patrick, there was a worry 24 hours ago when that name opened up that maybe they'd taken on and created perhaps a monster. What's the mood like in Switzerland now? Well, I think like the mood is sinking in that this is a positive deal for UBS and the stock is continuing the rally after we saw this monster turnaround yesterday with the stocks dropping as much as 15 percent before it turned around and closed actually higher. So everybody, I think, is agreeing that uh, the terms are very generous. It's government backed. Uh, there's a loss of sobering uh, buffer for UBS there. Of course, there are risks to the execution. It might not be a mega merger, merger in terms of market value, but it is still a mega merger in terms of operations. And UBS has probably to stem some costs first before all the benefits will float in. But overall, I would say like everybody is pretty happy now in, in European banking land for the moment uh, with an immediate crisis uh, avoided and um, that we are seeing in the stock prices today. Jan Patrick, we'll catch up with you soon in about 10 minutes. A lot more to talk about with Credit Suisse and UBS too. The broader equity market five minutes into the session, positive by a little more than 1% on the Nasdaq, up by a little more than 1% as well. Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth laying out her expectations for the Fed meeting this week and writing the following. We expect 25 basis points, but for the Fed to follow a similar path as the ECB, emphasizing data dependence so they don't have to commit to further hikes. Cameron, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Cameron, can we just start with a move in a two-year? And welcome to the program. <laughs> this two-year since the Fed last met has been all over the place. What do you make of it? 
It is really unprecedented, the kind of moves we've been seeing. I think we do have to ask the question how much positioning could be impacting the two-year as well. We have seen record short positioning in some of the futures data, which could be adding to some of this volatility. But the two-year really is a reflection of how much risk this market wants to take. With the two-year moving sharply lower, that's typically consistent with the bond market betting that the Fed is going to have to engage in very rapid interest rate cuts cuts simply because there is economic weakness on the horizon. So if we see the continue the two-year continue to break down, it really would raise the question of how much equity or risk asset resilience we could continue to see if we are going to see much more economic weakness. Cameron, the last time you and I spoke, you said it. It's not the inversion you need to fear. It's the bull mm -hmm. steepener. We've had a monster bull steepener. Typically, when that happens, where do you want to avoid in the equity market? Where do you want to be? Well, you typically want to avoid cyclicals and riskier parts of the market, and you want to be in defensives. And it's interesting because despite some of the rebound we saw in certain parts of the market last week, we did see a slight tone or shift away from cyclicals into more defensive parts of the market. So very quietly, you started seeing things like staples outperform the uh, consumer discretionary stocks or industrials and materials really breaking down last week. So so that could suggest that maybe that cyclical trade that really colored markets since the October lows is behind us. And that would be consistent with a bull steepener, which is reflecting greater economic weakness on the horizon. There are people who want to play the recovery off the back of a rate cutting cycle. They want to play the recovery before we see the recession. Cameron Blackrock came out with this. They say we stay underweight equities downgrade credit, prefer short-term government bonds. We don't see central banks coming to the rescue with rate cuts, but using other tools to ensure financial stability. The Fed is going to hike this week. Now, Cameron, a few months ago, a lot of people said the same thing. The Fed's not going to save you. It's not going to save you. And here we are, a few bumps in a road, a couple of bank failures later, and all of a sudden it's rate cuts. The bank's going to save, the Federal Reserve's going to save you, get along the NASDAQ. What do you say back to them? Well, the Fed has an, a, a huge inflation-sized pickle in this, which is that every other time that they have come in to support financial markets, the reality has been is that inflation has been at or below their target, meaning it's below 2% on the core PCE. And that's simply not the case anymore. So we've talked a lot about how the Fed doesn't want to be Arthur Burns with that stop-go policy of cutting rates and hiking rates and that really cemented inflation of the 70s. But we also have to ask the question, does the Fed not to want to be Alan Greenspan? Do they not want to cut rates by 100 basis points like they did in 1998 in the face of LTCM and effectively create an asset bubble which could exacerbate inflation in our current environment? So we think that it's far more of a tough decision of a, of a catch-22 than at any other time really since the early 90s. I've been quoting Dario Perkins from T.S. Lombard all morning, who tweeted a little bit earlier on this morning that central banks are stuck between the ghosts of the 1970s and their PTSD from 2008. Cameron, he said he thinks that PTSD wins out. Cameron, what do you think wins out? Mm. Well, I think that things would have to get worse before they get better. We'd have to see far more systemic banking issues for the Fed to completely put its inflation fighting mandate on the back burner. The reality is, is that the real economy, real economic data that we're seeing today still suggests that they should be fighting inflation and raising rates. However, the financial economy is showing enough weaknesses that in the past, if inflation wasn't an issue, that they would be at least pausing or cutting. So we think given the fact that now they have these two masters to serve, you effectively have to see even more weakness really reveal itself within the banking sector before they would completely ignore the inflation fight. Because they've told us many times inflation creates financial instability itself, which they do want to avoid. Cameron, I see all these estimates about the financial instability of the last couple of weeks and how it equates to perhaps Federal Reserve tightening. This came from Goldman and the team led by Jan Hatzius, they said that this could be the equivalent of 25 to 50 basis points of Fed rate hikes. Cameron, is it too early to make that conclusion? 
it all depends on the path of loan growth. One of the most interesting things in 2022 is that we saw loan growth continue to run at a high single digit clip all year. That's despite the fact that the Fed was rapidly raising rates and you saw those senior loan officer surveys talk about tightening lending conditions, yet loan growth chugged along. So is this the situation? Is this regional banking issue the, the spark that gets loan growth to finally roll over, which really would be that tightening of financial conditions that would work its way through the real economy. And so we have to watch this closely, but loan growth is a famously lagging indicator as well, and it could move slowly. So we'll watch small bank loan growth the closest. Large banks had already moderated their loan growth quite a bit. Small banks still running in that high single digits. If that rolls over, that's the sign that this is kind of doing the Fed's tightening for it. Hey Cameron, a lot of people tuning in today. And I think they've all got similar thoughts about the psychology of this meeting. One tweet that I received in the last hour, I believe the market will sell off if the Fed does nothing tomorrow or gets spooked thinking that the banking industry is worse than it is. 25 basis points is the best they can do. Do you believe there is that sense, Cameron, going into this news conference that Chairman Powell somehow knows something that we don't? Yeah, it's the question of what lies beneath. And if they do nothing, do they see something that we don't see? Now, that's also giving the Fed a lot of credit to see into the banking system. Don't forget that Powell talked at one of his most hawkish testimonies just a couple of days before the SVB issue. The question is, do they have even greater visibility now that would suggest that there is something much bigger, something much more systemic at work here? and that they need to pause and they need to take more aggressive action to be accommodative. I think that's what the market would take if they decided to do nothing. And if we see in that dot plot more interest rate cuts or a lower terminal rate, that could be another signal that they see something that we don't. Well, we've got a bounce right now. Cameron, thank you. Cameron Dawson at New Edge. New Edge Wealth. We've got a bounce in this equity market at more than 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, positive by a little more than 1% in the bond market. Treasury selling off, yields rising by almost 20 basis points on a two-year, 4.17%. That's a big move at the front end of the curve. I know what you're thinking. We've had monster moves over the last couple of months, but that's still a big move, up by 19 basis points on a two-year. Coming up on this program, investors still feeling the fallout from UBS's takeover of Credit Suisse. Regulators have moved very quickly with the UBS situation, that's a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, we've had some surprises, such as the AT1 bonds being written down uh, ahead of uh, equity holders. A conversation up next. Regulators have moved very quickly with the UBS situation, that's a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, we've had some surprises, such as the AT1 bonds being written down uh, ahead of uh, equity holders. Uh, so, you know, investors have to kind of understand that, you know, in a crisis, sort of anything can happen. The fallout of UBS's takeover of Credit Suisse, S&P and Moody's lowering their outlook on UBS to negative from stable, writing the following. We see material execution risk in UBS's integration of Credit Suisse, the deal wiping out Credit Suisse's AT1 bonds. PIMCO facing up to $807 million in losses. Invesco, that number could be 370. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Jean-Patrick Barnett in Frankfurt, alongside Shanali Basak here in New York. Shanali, this has been a controversial 24 hours. It certainly has been because we know that the prospectuses say one thing and now we know the central banks of the different regions are coming out to protect bondholders as well that be can quickly become equity holders as we've seen in the case of Credit Suisse and UBS. Now I want to point out a really interesting statistic, John, that we've heard from our team. The analysis shows that UBS actually has the highest amount of additional tier one capital here as a percentage of its highest forms of regulatory capital, that is CET1. And so there are questions here about even UBS's own exposure to this form of debt after we saw the wipeout over at Credit Suisse. Now what these investors will do after being wiped out, you mentioned PIMCO and Vesco, add BlackRock in there to the tune of more than $100 million, plus many other bondholders here that thought these bonds were plain vanilla just about. They did not factor in this form of risk. 
What next? That's the big question. Remember, PIMCO, of course, is a $1.7 trillion asset manager. It's short in the scope of that. But again, this was a way that they engaged significantly in the European banking system. Will that be as attractive of an outcome moving forward, especially for banks like UBS and Barclays, frankly, that have so much of this capital as a percentage of their CET1? Uh, Jan Patrick, there's a lot of unhappy people around this issue, about this issue, particularly in the last 24, 48 hours. But this isn't the only issue that is drawing controversy. It is also the fact there will be no shareholder vote. Now, Jan Patrick, I, I read the FT piece, and it was a fantastic piece about the story of the weekend. And I keep returning to this quote. They cite someone, one person close to one of the three major shareholders, and this was the quote. You make fun of dictatorships, and then you can change the law over the weekend. What's the difference between Saudi Arabia and Switzerland now? It's really bad. Jan Patrick, what changed for Swiss banking over the weekend? Well, I mean, like it's uh, it's a question for the European banking sector. I would say the same for uh, for the bond issue that we now have a, a a case of a first president in like really harsh measures towards the the shareholders and the bondholders. And you can debate this if this was necessary or not. Uh, in how much trouble Credit Suisse actually was, and if like such a hasty decision was uh, was warranted. The fact that they took it um, tells me that there was some sign to them that they were fearing a, a, a wider contagion and a bigger, big, bigger issue for the European banking sector. And they said to themselves, probably like, let's take that step and just secure the whole system and then we deal with the fallout later. Uh, but overall, um, the question uh, will be if like, have they ruined the European banking sector on the bond side and on the equity side uh, for quite a while? And only time will tell how investors will like digest this. And if they come back to, to the European banking sector with the confidence that this was a, a one off, and not uh, not the rule. Bank investors learn things. I think JP Morgan learned from their experience acquiring banks in a financial crisis and then inheriting the regulatory and legal risk associated with that. UBS, I don't think it's a surprise that they got the government guarantee over the weekend. I wonder if Middle Eastern investors will learn from this as well. Jan Patrick, the next time a European bank or Swiss bank gets into trouble, how reluctant do you think that pool of capital is going to be this time around? Well, they will definitely be a little bit more reluctant than they have been uh, previously, and they will probably like not do those risky uh, again because, like, I think the Saudis knew that uh, putting a lot of money into Credit Suisse is kind of a gamble. Of course, but the bank had some prospectus and and, and some idea of a, of a turnaround plan. But you never know; uh, banking execution can be quite tough, uh, and Credit Suisse didn't have a great tra track record to do so. So, I, if they if they wouldn't if they they would knew about the the risk, I'm sure um, that's something you have to consider when you invest into banks uh, at all time. So, is this market burned? Maybe for now, yes, I would say so. Uh, but the long run, I, I'm sure, like if there's an interesting and a compelling equity story, then investors will be very happy to come back into European banking shares. You won't hear much about European banks today because the stocks are up. European bank stocks are up by 4.8 percent. No real drama there right now. Jan Patrick, Shanali, to the both of you. Thank you. Your broader equity market about 22 minutes into the session, positive, almost 1 percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up nine tenths of 1 percent with some sector price action. Here's Abby. It's interesting, John, because today we're looking at some classic sector action. Energy is the top sector on the morning, up 2.7 percent in line with oil. And then we have the financials up sharply, too, up 2.1 percent as yields climb. And on the relief rally for the regionals in the middle, we have some of the tech, material, industrials. And then on bottom, all of your high dividend yielding stocks, those interest rate sensitive stocks, they are those sectors are underperforming. Utilities and consumer staples both down. Real estate and healthcare also underperforming. On the year, though, this is the story. It's extraordinary. You have communication services, so basically your Twitters, your Googles, Amazons, uh, and uh, sharply higher, up 16%. Tech also up about the same amount. The regional banks, on the other hand, plunging down 22%, on pace for the worst year since 2009. The bigger banks also, broader banks also down about 7%. Quite a divergence that we're seeing so far this year, and we're only a few months in, John. Abby, thanks for that. Looking forward to the coverage tomorrow. The Federal Reserve coming up. Looking at your market right now, about 23 minutes into the session. Equities on the S&P up by 1%. Your trading diary up next.